Good morning, family. How you doing? I'm your brother, Vimeo Dees. Peace to you, peace to your home, peace to your family, peace to your community, peace to your ancestry, peace to my community, peace to my ancestry, and peace to the nation that you, I, and they are building. Peace also to the God of forces, the great spirit above, the mother below. This is M.T. Marathi. Whoa! So lightning. I haven't done that in a long time, you know? Um, <clears throat> in all my years of being on YouTube, um, goes back to 2007 first time I actually got on YouTube, um, there are really only a handful of channels that I've um, ever, oh, give me one second, family. So there's ever only been um, a number of uh, YouTube channels that I've liked significantly enough where um, I don't know how to put it, where I look forward to their every single video coming out. Um, most YouTube channels I get tired of within a couple of years and, you know, kind of drift off from them. But there is one that pretty much since I've come across this channel um, back in, I think it was 2015, uh, might have been 2014, but I'm going to say 2015. Uh, I have looked forward to just about every video that he has put out. Um, and over the last three years, I want to say, might be four, but definitely three years, there's not a video that he hasn't released that I've not watched three or four times. That channel, the title of that channel is Ancestral Production. And while there is this fire within me that wants to spend like the next hour telling you about how great that channel is. The reason why I'm doing this video is because I made a statement on his, on one of his videos a couple of weeks ago. And <clears throat> the ancestors in preparing me for what I didn't know at the time was my older brother's passing. Um, there's this energy that came around me and I was really not able to communicate some of the sharp points that I wanted to communicate in defending that statement that I made to him. This is not a video that is about him. <laughs> this is a video about me and something that I said to him and the reason why I said it. And I want to start off by saying... Um, I did not make this statement in isolation. I have made this statement to white people. I have made this statement on social media platforms. I have made this statement literally face to face with white when talking to white people. And <clears throat> so this isn't one of those things where um, I'm becoming big online. You know, I'm like, getting those online muscles and I'm talking trash that I ain't willing to talk, you know, in real life. So the statement that I made to him was that it is my belief that statistically those European Americans, those white rays, white people um, who we would classify as known racist not anti-racist, but non-racist, they're not racist, um, they are statistically a minority. And my argument, my argument in real life has been that they constitute, no matter if you're talking about Europe, the United States, Canada, around the world, statistically, you're talking about 15% of the population maybe if maybe if I'm in a good mood, 20% of their population being non-racist. I do not believe it is one-fourth of their population. I'd like to believe it gets as high as that, but I don't believe it's one-fourth. I believe that really 15% of their population never going to be racist, ever going to be racist. It's not in them to be racist. Now, 
what sometimes makes that number seem bigger is you have another 25 to 25% or 20 to 25% that could be racist. They choose to be racist or they choose not to be racist. They kind of fall in between, you know, I'm becoming less racist over time or I'm becoming more racist over time. And um, that 25%, I just split it right down the middle. So 12.5, 12, 12.5. 12, uh, 12 so 12.5% of it roughly goes into the category of non-racist. So that's now over a quarter. That's your 27.2%. Uh, if I'm generous and I give them five more percent for the non-racist, then you're talking about 32%. That's about one third of the population of white people that are either non-racist or lean non-racist. And then you have the rest who are the lean racist or are racists. Now let's get into the statistics, the, the number that I think are racist. I think the majority of white people are racist. On a good day, I think it's 50% right down the middle. Boom. On other days, 60%. 60%. Just flat out. But I'm willing to say 50% with the rest falling into maybe. Now, so 15% absolutely never going to be racist. 25% kind of falling in the middle. So that's 40. And then 60%, they're going to be racist no matter what you do. Now, if I'm generous and I say 50%, then the additional 10% goes in with the 25. So you got 35. Now, the reason why um, I hold this belief, it's not something that I've come to lightly. It's not something that I have, it's not something that I've gleaned from hating white people or disliking white people or wanting to hate white people or wanting to hate or, or wanting to dislike white people. I have thought about this immensely as I've looked at racism and history over the last seven years of my life. And one thing is inescapable to me. You can't change who you are. You can't change who you are. What I mean by this is the history, the history of Europe prior to colonialization. So prior to, let's just say 1500, boom, back. The history of Europe. To say that it has been violent, to say that it has been almost psychopathic, to say that it has been destructive to the, to the essence of what it means to be a human, may be understating the history of Europe. It is a tragedy writ large across history. That's what Europe is. Only in the last 80 years has some semblance of peace, and Barack Obama um, referenced this shortly before he left office. Only in the last 80 years has some semblance of peace among what we would consider the ruling cultures of Europe been achieved. The last 80 years, I think, literally represent, this goes all the way back to the end of World War II. It's, it's been the longest period of peace among those major cultures in that region. It hasn't stopped other areas from Europe you know, from erupting into um, into uh, war and skirmishes and what have you. But Spain, Britain, Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands, 
Um, who else am I forgetting? Italy, France, France. Um, all of them, they've been peaceful. What does it say that if we go back over the last five, 6,000 years, that we will be hard pressed to find 80 years of peace among those folks? 80 years. Not only that, when you dive into the cultures that built themselves up in that in in that constant constant war atmosphere you get just diabolical instances of cruelty and most of the cruelty comes from the top down so when we look at the Inquisition, I, I looked at a um, a book that I got off of archive.org some years back, which actually showed pictures, um, um, artistic renderings of what they did to people during the Inquisition. I had to stop like 10 pages in. When you look at how they treated their children during these period during these periods of time, selling children into slavery, which inevitably, ladies and gentlemen, usually resulted in sex slavery. Okay, when you look at their history, and particularly how the upper class treated the lower classes, and then got the lower classes to treat each other. I mean, it's despicable, and it's psychopathic. It is horribly psychopathic. When you look at that, and then you look at how Europeans treated everybody who was deemed lower than them when they left Europe, from a, from a, a psychology standpoint, you can't be surprised by any of that. If you just spent the last 5,000 years pretty much being a peasant who could get abused and molested and treated horribly by the upper elite until they needed you to treat someone else horribly, which if you didn't do it, they would then really treat you horribly. So you did it. And now you were in a position where the upper elite was like, now nah, we all the same now. We love you. We, we need you. We need you to go over there and settle these lands and, and build up country. And you are, you know, you are a, a, a cherished extension of this country. When you go overseas and you do these for the crown and glory, you go from being the person who is abused to the person who can now do the abusing, what do we learn in psychology? Okay? If you live in an abusive situation, if you live in an abusive situation, father is beating the mother. The mother is going to tend to beat the children. And the children typically then take it out on the, on the animals. We know this. This is just one-on-one -on -one psychology. So if you go from an instance where you are being beaten down every day by this rapacious, psychopathic, maniacal elite to a moment where they need you and they say, by the way, we ain't going to treat you that bad. We may do some stuff to you, but we ain't going to treat you like we used to. But you see them people who don't look like you over there? God says that they are worse than you. You can do whatever you want to them. If you just went through 5,000 years of being beaten down into a bloody pulp, what do you think you're going to do to the next people who they... If the abuser tells you, 
You can beat the children. And he doesn't care. You're going to beat the children. And you might even kill them. Well, that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. You can't expect in an abusive situation. You cannot expect somebody who has been beaten down until they were nothing to respond like a person who has a clear head on their shoulder. It's not going to happen. Now, we have been 600 years, less, 500 years, since they came out of Europe and they brought their, their traumatized psychologies or their traumatized psyches with them. They spent 5,000 years having all of that happen to them. Do you think it's going to just disappear after 500? No way. No way. And despite the efforts of their marketing gurus, you can still see the problems in their own communities. You can still see the problems in their own communities. You can still see the hyper abuse. You can still see the degradation of life. I mean, the United States pretty much should be looked at as a reincarnated portal of, of, of what Europe um, prior to the Enlightenment was. Because all of the spiritual energy that ruled Europe created the feudalist system, created the structures of degradation and of abuse and of 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 just absolutely ill temperament in the lower classes that all came to the united states that all came to the united states and so we are now seeing within the government of the united states a repeating of the cycle of the elite not caring about the lower classes. It's the same thing that happened during the, during the feudalist centuries in Europe. It all came here. For this reason, <laughs> I don't expect them to change very much. Now, um, and this is also why you have these 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 died in the wool conservatives who won't budge on anything. They're stuck. They're stuck six, seven hundred years ago. Their minds, their spiritual minds ain't grown since then. Now, the argument to refute what I'm saying. The argument to refute what I'm saying um, that is typically made is new generation. The new generation. The new generation is showing that they're different. I call hogwash on that. And I call hogwash because they made the same argument with my generation. And looking back on my generation, it just wasn't true. Moreover, I know because I have uh, nieces who are part of this new generation. They're experiencing racism every day, too in school from kids they were having conversations about racism that sound very familiar to me when they talk about the arguments that the young white kids in high school i mean this is supposed to be the open generation young white kids in high school these arguments that they are presenting to refute um the claim of racism I've heard the arguments before. The arguments were similar when I was in school. Mm -mm. Moreover, because the ancestors have been working with me before I knew they were working with me, I have paid attention to the long cycles that are apparent within even my generation. I'm part of the millennial generation. 
but I'm on the older end of the millennial generation. I'm about to be 40. A couple of years, guys, a couple of years. But I am going to be 40. In my generation, we were said to be, you know, that generation that was going to break the cycle of racism. Uh Uh-uh. It hasn't happened. People who I looked back upon and thought, man, these are good people. These are awesome people. You know, they get me. They understand me. They didn't get me. And they didn't understand me. And I know this because as time has passed on, they are the ones that are making the same arguments that these young kids in high school are making of trying to dismiss racism. They're the ones that are making arguments that make my hair want to fall out. Where I'm like, logically, what you're saying doesn't make sense. So I'm seeing a repeating of these patterns. Moreover, if we just think about what a generation is, a generation is a continuance of the previous generation. Now, it is also a continuance of the previous generation. Now, if that generation happens to be able to, and we're seeing this a little bit with that with that statistical minority, if they're able to um, look at the previous generations and say, these are your mistakes, this is why you made those mistakes, here is how we're going to fix them, then they're likely to change their vibratory frequency and thus change their generational mind. Each generation does have a destiny. I do believe that. The problem that we're facing right now is there is a statistical minority that is committed in the white community, committed to overturning the social norms, and they have been vilified. Now, this isn't anything new. You go back 120 years ago, they were doing the same thing with that statistical minority in that generation, or with, yeah, the statistical minority who was calling out the problems of the system and saying we need to fix these things. And even some of them back then knew racism had to be dealt with. This is your Messiah portion of your generation or of this generation. They've already set themselves against it. You have another statistical minority that's part of the other end who call themselves traditionalists. These are your well, for lack of a better word, and many of them will get pissed off because I'm about to say it, but it's true. Most of them count themselves as Christian, but they're not. They're anti-Christs. They're like anti-Bhatis. But this time, they're anti jins They're actually trying to attack the good and destroy the good. The problem, the reason why I call this you know, problem is because that statistical minority who is an antigen, I think I'm using that appropriately, um, who is going after the good, they have been, their, their, uh, their goals, their way of thinking, their, uh, even their vision for destroying the good has been magnified and projected outward as if it is the Masonic vision. That's a problem. Now, on the other end, they're just getting up with trying to, you know, magnify and project their vision. I don't know if they're going to be able to do it. Now, us as black folks, we can take their vision. Dr. King did this. But we can't, we can take their vision and we can magnify it, but we can't do it at the expense of our vision. Because our vision is greater than theirs. So their vision is, is a part of ours. If what they are doing is successful, meaning they can project it outward. 
they do have the ability to change not only those people who lean non-racist to completely non-racist, but they might actually get out there and be able to change the others, which would give 50-50. And that would then change the dynamic of the planet. It wouldn't, it wouldn't um, change the dynamics of the race, not for another generation, but it would change the dynamics of the planet and it would put the other group on the path to extinction. Can they do it? They can. We're going to have to help them. Um, <laughs> it's a difficult, it's a difficult, you know, argument and it's a difficult path that I have to make. Or, um, excuse me, it's a difficult argument that I have to make and a difficult path to have to continue. Because I'm optimistic. I believe that we, working with that minority, can accelerate these changes. And I believe we can do it. Because I understand, and I give all praises to the ancestors for this because they revealed this to me. I understand that we are now in a judgment period. And I don't, we're in a judgment in a transition period. The judgment period isn't what most people think it is. They're ascribing it to the um, Bible, but I'm not ascribing it to that kind of a judgment. Um, if you look at the history of the last hundred years. You can see a pattern that is quite striking. Um, there's two 40 year periods where you had absolutely opposing ideologies governing the country. And in between those periods, you had a 10 year um, transition zone. So you had from the 1930, from 1930 to 1940, you had a transition from the hyper-capitalist um, 40 years that had led up to that period, which uh, was very detrimental to mankind, humankind, human, basically humanity altogether. Um, but it also it also spelled uh, the calming down of the expansiveness of 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 Europeans. There just wasn't anywhere else for them to expand, basically. So it it marked the calming down of that. But then you you had to start getting into uh, sustainability and creating structures that were going to promote uh, economic equality and leisure, which the wealthy used to actually talk about that was part of what they were supposed to be doing. It was kind of like a divine mission, which they've lost over the last hundred, uh, 80 years. So that 40 year period was, or took place between 1890 and 1930. And it's kind of funny because you had two major great depressions in that era where the, you know, those who thought that they were God's gift to economic planning, man, their whole plans were just shattered in an instant. You had the 1890 depression, and then you had the beginning of the 1930 depression, which started in 1929, obviously. So then between 1930 and 1940, there was a shift to a more commonwealth welfare mindset within the United States. That was to me a choice that was handed to the US. Okay, we're going to give you um, a society that is built around democracy, commonwealthism, welfareism. We're going to give you the mindset necessary to build this. And they did. 1940 to Oh, wait. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. I moved it. I shifted. I shifted. The, um, uh, 
Wow. Can't believe I did that. Um, no, the 40 year period was 1930 to 1970. The 10 year period, um, the transition period was 1920 to 1930. Um, that was the transition, and that was why, you know, you've seen the stock market going like this, and then whoosh, off the edge. And then, <clears throat> see, that's the danger of not all, not sometimes using notes. Um, but I thank God, because I was looking at the math and going, wait a minute, the math doesn't make sense. But um, that was the transition period, was 1920 through 1930. And then the previous 40 years, which was 1880, note that was at the um, the definite conclusion of Reconstruction through 1920 was when you had the calming down of the expansion, the capitalist mantra of, you know, um, uh, you know, we're supposed to be building this for all of us. Uh, but by 1920, pretty much they had said forget about that. Well, I mean, they didn't say forget about it, but they weren't necessarily living up to it. So then the 1930 through 1970, you had the building of this Commonwealth democracy welfare state. Then you had the shift. And the answer to this continued to tell me that it wasn't a give me. It wasn't like we had to go into this second you know, this, this experimental period. Um, that was why there were so many people pushing for more democracy in the sixties and the fifties and for an expansion of, of welfareism and commonwealthism. And when I say welfareism, ladies and gentlemen, get it out of your mind, food stamps and stuff like that. Welfare is deeper than that. Welfare is a concept. It's not a program. Get a dictionary. That's why I keep telling you, get a dictionary. Um, but nonetheless, they killed and jailed the people who were pushing us towards the continuance of that system and of that spirit, spirit moving throughout the land. So they killed the people who were doing that work and jailed them and exiled them, mostly in the 70s. But, you know, there were some famous ones in the uh, 60s also. The 70s was a transition period to a more conservative, corporatist, friendly 40-year period. The ancestors, the Most High, gave them their wish. They wanted that experimental time to prove that their doctrine, their theory, as they had tried proving back in 1880 through 1920, that it would work in modern day times. We're now on the other end of that 40 year period. Note, the 40 year period that this conservatism started in was the beginning of Ronald Reagan's presidency eight, uh, 1980 also note that the last 40 year period was 1880 but that's what it is um so now we are in a transition decade and if you read the astrological uh maps and data and phases for the next 10 years you'll see this this constantly comes up this is a decade where there is going to be an immense spiritual fight for the coming 40 years. Because astrologically, and from an ancestral level, the coming 40 years, and then the, the, the next 40 years after that, which would be after the 10-year um, buffer, uh, these are supposed to be of some strife and turmoil, but also of collectivity. It's supposed to bring us together. We are supposed to come out of the end of this um, century a more unified planet if we don't kill ourselves. But we are supposed to come out of that a more unified, what we call democratic, collectivist planet. These people who think they're God are trying to bypass that. These people who think they're God they're trying to bypass it. And the ancestors, the most high, they ain't having it. One second, family. I'm back. I would encourage you, if you have not done this yet, look up the astrological alignments for the coming 10 years. It is fascinating. 
it is fascinating. Um, I hope to have some book recommendations soon on that. That'll help you out. Uh, but we need to understand, especially as black folks, you know, when it, this 10 year period is crucial. Now, I've talked a lot about the African Commonwealth. I want to talk also about something that's, that the ancestors did tell me that um, I just, man, I just found it so, it's so weird to think about. Because this this country is is heading for um, it's going to head for one of one of two things. It's going to either head for um, a catastrophic breakup, meaning it'll end up being two or three different nations, or it is going to give in to the to the winds of time and to that wonderful thing that Martin Luther King used to talk about uh, the. Uh, arch the arch of the arch of the universe is long but it bends towards justice there we go can't believe i couldn't remember that um one of my favorite sayings of his ever but these guys are literally trying to sidestep that i mean what's going on with covid19 should tell you already that they're trying to sidestep it they're trying to sidestep it um, this is literally telling us that we need to work the government and, and everyone at all levels need to work better together that the way that we have been working, the way that we have been living, that ain't going to cut it no more. This is literally telling us that it's over this capitalist nonsense, this consumerist nonsense, this idea of, of increasing prices to keep people impoverished and to keep people's willpower entrapped and ensnared. It's over. It's done. That's what it's trying to tell them. And these people are acting like they hear nothing. They hear nothing. This is, this is, be, before I get into the, the actual point, um, this whole catastrophic breakup thing, um, these, this is, <sighs> COVID-19 is the ancestor's answer to not plunging the world into a third world war. They showed me this earlier this week during one of my meditations for my older brother. And actually, I probably imagine he showed it to me. Um, this is <laughs> This literally is their attempt to not have us plunge into a world war because the third world war is going to be so devastating. It is going to cause so much chaos and disaster. They ain't going to get away, by the way. The wealthy think they, they've they they've built a hiding spot. Mm -mm. Mother Nature and stuff. They got something for them. They got something for them. This... This is the attempt. They're trying to get us to realize that we need to work better together and, and work more together and to unify under these ancient principles that, that all of these tribes and these cultures have upheld. But these freaking people don't want to do it. They don't want to do it because they think they're so much better. And so they would this is this is possibly one of the reasons why Trump is talking about, you know, escalating stuff with China, because they think they can escape by going to war. It's going to spin out of control and we're going to be in a third world war and it's going to get bad. I made a video one time and God, it scared the hell out of me. I didn't even want to make the video, but they pushed me to make the video where I said there could be foreign tanks on this land literally going block to block looking for these specific people and like they would catch them and they'd kill them like they'd put them on trial and they would kill them like dead done we're done dealing with the united states acting this way we're just killing all these people i'm not joking ladies and gentlemen the ancestors are serious this is an attempt to avoid that and these people are digging their heels in, trying to go right for it. Stupid. Let's talk about this catastrophic breakup. One second. 
All right, I'm back. So years ago, years ago, uh, 2012, I think, might have been 2011, the ancestors brought me into contact with a podcast that introduced me to this book. It's actually two books. I thought it was supposed to be a trilogy, but I've only been able to find two, which probably means there is a third book, but it's for academics and not for the public consumption. Um, this, this man wrote these two books again, Anthony J. Hall, and it, the series was called the Bowl with One Spoon series. It's supposed to be three of them. I've only found two. So this is the first book. It's Earth into Property. It is not a small book. It's 800 pages with like 750 of them being of content. The second one is that one, The American Empire and the Fourth World. And again, not a small book, but I wanted to show you something. This one is actually shorter. This one is um, about 540 pages of content. But I wanted to show you something that they had in the book. I can barely see that, so I'm hoping you guys can see it. All right, so, um, whoops, don't want to get my hand up there. All right, I'm hoping you can see that. That is a picture of the borders of the USA as proposed in 1812 uh, by Montreal and Quebec City Boards of Trade. That's a very different looking U.S. than obviously we have today. The three, and it would be three, um, if the United States was to go through this catastrophic breakup, it would split up into three different nations, or four, possibly, but the fourth would likely get absorbed into Canada. Um, much of your north, much of your north from Maine to um, Michigan down uh, to the Mason-Dixon just about would likely be one country. Um, and then it would likely get either absorbed into Canada or would remain independent. And the stuff out west will get absorbed, but not into Canada, into one of the other countries. Your um, West Coast, which would likely remain unified with that East Coast area, um, would also become independent. But again, they'd probably unify and then um, work to convert like Montana, South Carolina, North, uh, not South Carolina, North Dakota, and the like into becoming part of that country. And then you would have what would start out as a rebellion um, to the Confederate, uh, uh, an attempt to reestablish the Confederacy. But, and by the way, this comes after World War Three. But because of internal, because of the international um, resolve to give Afro-Americans, black people in this country, their own community, their own place to rest their heads, uh, the Confederacy would never work because we're going to take the most of that over. So from what is left, Texas, the Midwest, and a few border states that are rebellious, so we won't take them, including probably Tennessee for a while, but we may get that too. Um, they're going to split up into two countries. They're going to split up into two countries, and they're not going to have a time of it, causing one of them to likely get absorbed into the new alliance that is the um, West Coast and the East Coast. This isn't a guarantee, ladies and gentlemen, but I want to give you an idea of what we're looking at, possibly. Now, it'll be after this catastrophic breakup that we achieve our greatest success. Because we are going to be left alone. We're going to have 
United Nations, the United Nations will cease to be what it is currently. And again, I think um, at that time, it'll be shifted to Africa. The Africans hold a lot of key, a lot of keys to peace and prosperity in the new world order. And once they are, once, once they ascend to their, and I mean this, their rightful place as the chiefs of that new world order, um, which it's the wrong title to use because it's not a new world order. It's really a reestablishment of the ancient world order. Um, everybody's going to have a say at the table because Africans, it's not about leading the, the chiefs of the ancient tribes held, held, um, held court. No, wrong, 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 wrong. I think held court would be how you would describe it to Europeans, but that's incorrect. They held the cosmic memory for our, um, They held our cosmic memory for our tr for how we acted, for our code of honor, and then they held, as did the indigenous people and the indigenous chiefs in the United States. They lost that man. That's as soon as they started letting Christianity in, it disrupted that Christian. Uh, it is such a disgusting spirit. They also held the 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 root to the culture and when the africans reestablish that ancient order and that means connection to that ancient root what that then does is it draws in beings from all across the world and they then become part of this chief elder group which raises the vibratory frequency of that ancient root and spreads that energy throughout the world. We are entering a period in time, the um, 2040s to the 2050s, where you're going to see the coming to the forefront of a Messiah generation. I'm not talking about a small group of people here. I'm talking about a Messiah generation. We're seeing some of them rise right now. But it'll be nothing compared to what you see in 2040. The, the changes are going to be fast that decade. So we will then start to literally build bridges um, between our Commonwealth, which will the, the states as they exist now will not be the Commonwealth system as as you know. We once when we get a hold of that land, we're going to change the structure completely. They're going to be smaller, more like Massachusetts size, which helps us to administer better and things like that. Um, and then, and that's all they show me, by the way, of that. But and then we're going to start putting in programs that emphasize the worth and well-being of ourselves, nature and the like, and that's going to spread to the Caribbean, which is going to give us a lot of influence in the Caribbean, and they're going, by like mid-century, a little bit over mid-century, because most of this will probably take place in the 2040s and 2050s, so by like the 2060s, the 2070s, you're looking at possibly, not possibly, well, you're looking at possibly the entire Caribbean being under the jurisdiction of our new commonwealth, and us being strongly reestablished to Africa and helping them uniform, um, helping them cooperatively, mutually, helping them mutually build up their commonwealths, which all of the country names that you know of today just about all go away, including Egypt. Egypt turns back to Kemet. But that's another story. Oof. Egypt is in for some time, boy. They messed up. They messed up. They when they did um when they did uh 
when they something with the sewage the the Suez no yeah something with the Suez Canal something with the Nile when they've they've done something with damming up the Nile I don't know why I was thinking about the Suez but um they one second all right, I'm back, family. And yeah, I was thinking about the right one. Okay, something with the Suez Canal. When they built the Suez Canal or expanded the Suez Canal, they they covered in water like three or four dozen special tombs. And most of them, you know, you couldn't get to anyway. They're airtight. You didn't even know they were there. But there was a couple that they did know were there. And they underestimated the importance of those tombs. Those tombs. Well, let's just say the deities that they were built to, to, most of which haven't been fully studied yet, most of which haven't been, I think, released to the public, or in some, in a couple of cases, I don't even know if they've even been discovered yet. Um, that energy is coming back. And Egypt's going to fall. Hear me. Egypt, as run by the Arabs, will fall. Not to Israel, not to Palestine, not to a European force. But by mid-century, the original inhabitants are coming back. You are going to have an Arab leader who was born. Can't say when. But an Arab, uh, an Arab leader who was born who is going to understand uh, democratic values, who is going to want to reinstill them into the country with a full understanding that this is going to reignite and reunite the ancient lineages in that country. He wants it to happen. He wants it to happen because he understands it needs to happen. Kemet needs to come back. Oh, that's the heartbeat of the world right there. And it's, uh, anyway, so mutually we'll be helping out Africa and Africa will be helping us out. And a lot of the country names that you know will be gone. Um, they will also reorganize themselves along the same pattern of smaller is better, you know, as a Commonwealth concept. And it's no longer going to be, you know, we have to represent each and every single Commonwealth on the planet, or excuse me, not on the planet, but on the, um, on the flag. Forget that mess. They ain't even going to be worrying about that. It's going to be a, if the whole of Africa turns into Commonwealths that are, you know, the, I think they're going to only allow the Commonwealths to be like three or 4,000 square miles. So you do the math. I mean, you do the math. If you have a commonwealth in a continent as big as Africa, um, uh, 3,000 square miles, even 4,000 square miles, you're looking at, what, three, 2,000, 2,500 commonwealths on the continent? They don't care. They're going to do it. And they're going to do it because of this, this, this concept of, teaching of of learning multiple languages by the time you're like four or five which is what they used to do back in the ancient days you would know you would know 10 or 12 languages by the time you were 10 and that's what they want again so um that's going to be like we're all going to be the whole world's going to be on the upswing during this time period now the answer does want me to stress this if we are to avoid the catastrophic breakup and it'll come after a civil war okay if we are to avoid the catastrophic breakup what's going to have to happen is black folks are going to have to be given our own space to live work and breathe in this country and this country is going to have to change drastically. It's going to have to change towards Commonwealth principles. Um, African concepts of honor and stuff is going. To, it's going to have to be infused into this country. European concepts of honor, 
higher honor is going to have to be infused into this country. Um, and basically, when the time comes for Africa to take its place, the United States and Europe can't fight it, which they've been fighting it. They were fighting it in the in the uh, the 1970s and 60s because we were supposed to rise and then Asia would rise. They fought it. They fought against the cosmic doctrine. And here we are. It is unlikely that they're going to do that. The United States would have to be subservient to a point to Africa. And I don't believe that the people who are in charge of this country is willing to do that. So it's likely the country is going to fade and break up. Now, I will say, because I pointed this out in an earlier video, because we are going to be run so well, and particularly Texas, and that wonderful um, country that is created using Texas, and part of Texas is going to uh, succeed before the rest of it, I think. But they're going to push into Mexico to try to gain more territory in Mexico, which they'll probably succeed in doing for a while, till we come on the scene and we're like, yeah, no, no. And we're going to liberate them. And then that's going to, well, we're going to liberate them, but it's not going to start them becoming part of um, our commonwealth. It, it That's almost like we're going to have really good relationships with Mexico. And we're going to get to a point where like we're doing so much interchanging of stuff. We're like, we're, you know, sending them stuff, they're sending us stuff and what have you. And we're helping them finally root out the drug problem, which may actually start before us. You know, there's this weird thing that might happen in the 2030s with drugs and the military. Like the U.S. may try to invade Mexico to stop the drug lords, which might actually help and might work. But um, we will then get to a point where we're just like, why don't we just be, why don't you just come and be part of our commonwealth? And Mexico would be like, seems like a good idea to me. Now, the fight that takes place between us and Texas, um, it's going, it's not going to result in us like annexing Texas, but what it is going to do, and this is going to be, uh, you know, I don't know how this is going to take place, but part of Texas is going to like succeed and like come to us and be like, yo, can we just join you? Because we're not. Texas is going down and we just don't want to be a part of that crap anymore. And. You know, we're not going to be in a position to be like, yeah, because, you know, to say what you want about Texas. Texas is still pretty badass, but. Something's going to happen where we're going to be made to kind of step in and to stop something bad from happening in that region. And then we're going to just say, yeah, we'll annex you since you want to be here. Come on. Um, by the end of the century, though, most of the former United States will be with us. I mean, that's the, that's the tragic part about it is the U S could have just taken its rightful place, um, which is an extension of Africa. And it wouldn't have lost any of its prestige. It wouldn't have lost any of its motives or, or, or power. It just would have been a, uh, an extension of a greater spirit. But by the time the most of the United States, and I'm excluding much of the East Coast for, um, you know, that's what they're showing me. Um, by the time that happens, though, um, you know, climate change is going to be really ramping up and Mother Nature is going to be on this hundred year bender of trying to restructure herself and get herself back into rebalancing. We might see a cold spell at the end of this uh, century or this decade. They said decade. So maybe the end of this decade, that'll kind of confuse people. But we're going to see that a lot. And then like at the end of the century, the beginning of next century, we might see an extended cold period of like 20 to 30 years where 
um, yeah, people are going to be like, yeah, pff, there ain't no such thing as climate change. But then it's going to jack right back up for 20 or 30 years. And it's just Mother Nature getting her balance back. Uh, that's stated. Everything that's going on right now, this whole consciousness concept, is aiming for that time period when all of us are together. And we're all aligned. That includes the minority in Europe. Don't forget what Hopi said. Four rays. Black, red, yellow, white. And Hong Kong will likely become part of, you know, our wonderful Commonwealth too. And China might actually break up by mid-century. There's a lot of repressed anger and rage in China. And I think by next decade, mid-next decade, you're going to see a lot of it coming out. It's a shame. It is a shame. They were able to survive through colonialism, but they won't be able to survive through their own contradictions. Mainly because they're not answering the cosmic call, man. Same thing with Russia. Russia's not going to break up, though, but the inner conflicts might be a little bit too much as, um, you know, kind of it'll devolve into, uh, I don't even know what to call it, factions and, you know, all of the problems with the permafrost and stuff. It's Anyway, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, I didn't expect this to be an hour long. Leave them below, guys. I just want to say that, you know, my brother, my older brother, who um, made his journey home, um, I spent much of the last week morn uh, mourning for him and doing uh, meditations associated with mourning for him and letting him go and, you know, accepting our new connection on the ancestral realm. And um, God bless him, man. You know, I hope the ancestors keep him. It is so funny because Bobby Hammett used to talk about not judging people um, based on their physical appearances. And my brother, he, if you met him, you know, you'd meet this guy who, on the outward appearance, was an alcoholic, drug addict, um, but he was, he had such a big heart. And that's the one thing that everyone keeps telling me about is his big heart. And I knew that. I knew that. Um, moreover, he's a very strong spirit. You know, he he struggled a little bit to cross, to, to transition. Uh, I went up and saw him in his final days. And he was struggling to get to the other side. But his power, even as he was attempting to pass was still, I couldn't believe the amount of energy that I could just feel off of his body. And, you know, in his last days, he wasted away. Well, really in the last year, he's wasted away, which was crazy to me because my brother's always been like a big dude and he just wasted away. It was pretty much his, his, his trunk that was left and his hands and feet were just bones uh, and, and skeleton, his energy is amazing. You know, with him being on the other side now, I thought it was going to take him months to ascend. I thought it was going to take him months to ascend. No, he's been, he's been up there and he's been back already. He's been up there and he's been back already. It's crazy to me, you know, but it just goes to show you judge energy guys don't 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 judge the outward appearances judge the energy and so i thank him for this because i think tonight this whole thing um i've been trying to do something like this all week and all week i've been tripping over my words and you know not able to get the um the energy right and what have you and the ancestors told me earlier in the week they're like yeah just wait till saturday saturday is when you're going to be able to really get back on track but i was impatient 
The mere fact that I was able to record this today shows a powerfulness that I had to share with you. The ancestors, I don't just say it to say it. Let me just put it that way. They're real. When we talk about the gods of, um, of Kemet, we're talking about ancient orders. And we're talking about elderhoods that are deeply ingrained in the ancestors. We're also talking about, and I know um, Bobby Hammett talked about this briefly, but we're also talking about inner elements that we can actually access, that we can utilize for our own benefit and for the benefit of those who are around us in the ancestral work that we are meant to do. We're talking about something that is greater. Oh, absolutely greater than the word God that we give to it. That's why we have to understand God as an acronym. Then we have to understand God as GOAD. And even GOAD isn't enough to talk about the elemental truths that are in these concepts. When we look at Ma'at and we look at her, her, her precepts, we look at her principles, which family... Uh, I got a gift coming to you guys for um, about my, I just don't know when I'm going to be able to give it to you. You know, the ancestors started talking to me about her years ago. And um, I, I have said nothing about it up to now. So this is the first time that I'm even mentioning to uh, mentioning it. Uh, but sometime in the future, I will definitely be able to hand it over to you. It's something creative um, that I think you'll enjoy. But when we look at her precepts and we, we start to deal with the fact that Ma'at is an element also. I mean, that, it's a, that internally she's a molecule structure for us. What power lies in that? The same with a set. The same with um, Heteru. The same with Tahuti. The same with Anubis, who has been, oh, excuse me, not Anubis. I apologize. That's the uh, uh, that's a European name to him. Um, Anpu, who has been just absolutely, absolutely wonderful in helping me with getting my brother to the other side and helping me deal with the the realignment of our um, of our relationship, which is what happens when a person transitions. It's just a realignment of your relationship. You go from having them in your heart, the connection, you go from having it in your heart, in your spirit. That is, and, and both of those concepts are linked to the body and linked to our our physical selves, you go from that to having their connection be uh, aligned with your ancestral spirit, which isn't really a spirit. It's something that's connected to your soul and connected to your main being. And so you can be transformed in the loss of that connection from here and the reconnection to the ancestral because uh, the power that you can now access with somebody who has gone to the other side, somebody who you were close to. Yes, it's right. You can cry. You can, you know, it's painful, but you can also prepare for it. And that's something I'm going to have to talk about in depth sometime because you can prepare for it. And I've, I did that. They had me preparing for it. Once when I found out about it and it came out of nowhere, when I found out about it, they had me immediately prepare for it and it changed how I related to it. They took me through a process, ladies and gentlemen, 
family. They took me through a process and it changed me and how I responded to it. There's a power in it. And these elements, which are these, these God particles that make up who we are, If we only knew. Questions, comments, concerns. I hope you have some. Leave them below. I'm your brother, Vi Mayor Deese, and our into this. Peace.